Hello. So it was only a few months ago that I reviewed one of these, but Hyundai's now used it as the basis for a full electric car. So here we go again. If I was really lit, sorry, efficient, I would just do this. See what I did there? Same thing, but silent. Thanks very much and good night. Okay, so there is a little bit more to it than that, but not that much really. And far from being a negative, all the Kona Electric here does is shows just how far electric cars have come in a relatively short space of time. Honestly, I'd buy this Kona over a conventionally engined one any day of the week. Unless there was a power cut that week, obviously. So powertrain aside, is this really exactly the same as a conventionally engined Kona? Not quite. Most obviously, there are a few aesthetic changes. So in here, the basic architecture is the same, but the centre console has been swapped out for something altogether sleeker and higher and more futuristic looking. The main difference is that you get gear select buttons instead of a normal lever, and there is this massive space underneath it to put stuff on. And on the outside, it's a similar update, so same basic shape, but without the requirement for a radiator grill at the front, you get this smooth bit, which again is sleeker and cleaner and more modern looking. It is pretty cool, although the more you look at it, the more that it looks like Hyundai signed a massive product placement agreement with a film production company, and they've sort of restyled it for the future on the cheap. And once that thought's in your head, it starts to look a bit naff, a bit demolition man. You drive. How exciting. I still like it though. And far more important than the highly subjective issue of aesthetics in any event is the fact that with the Kona Electric here, you lose nothing of the standard Kona's practicality. Hmm, technically you do lose something, you lose two litres of boot space, but you know, in reality you're getting the same boot, the same cabin space and the same flexible hatchbacky layout. It is worth saying though that this isn't the biggest boot in the class and it's also worth saying the Kona isn't the biggest of the small crossovers on the market either. And that's especially in rear legroom terms, but you know, it's okay, you'll get by, it seats five, and so no real problems. This is quantifiably a very practical electrical runabout. Decent glove box, decent cubby holes, decent large bottle holder, yakety yak. Don't talk back. Da, 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 da. And so we come to what's really important about this particular corner in the context of it not having a fuel tank. What's it like to live with? And it's there that the corner electric really shines. So you can has two versions of this, one called 39kWh and the other 64kWh. Those numbers denoting the capacity of the battery and thus the range of the car. Also the one with the bigger battery gets a more powerful electric motor. Now the performance difference looks quite wide in number terms as you can see, but due to the unique way that electric cars deliver their torque, you know the drill by now, all of it from zero RPM in principle. Even the lower powered one feels pretty... And guess what? Mm-hmm. Zippy. The quicker one, which is of course the one that Hyundai sent me, is positively rapid. Quicker, in fact, than the Volkswagen e-Golf, the basic BMW i3, and every Nissan Leaf you can buy bar the very top of the range one that costs 40 grand. Both electric corners offer mega battery range too, with even the basic one giving you a claimed 180 mile range, and the 64 version a truly impressive 279, and those figures come from the new stricter WLTP test as well. And based on my experience with the car over the last few days and that of some of the people in the office, they do seem like realistic numbers. And if those numbers help make the corner a genuinely non-terrifying electric ownership proposition, then the driving experience experience itself is another thing that will help nudge you off the electric fence. <laughs> this thing is just lovely to drive because it combines all the positive qualities of an electric car with those of a small crossover. No matter how depressing you find these things, believe me, I do empathise. I'd rather own a pet lion than own a small crossover. Cannot escape the fact that they make brilliant runabouts. You know the drill by now, right? High roof line, tall off the ground driving position, compact dimensions. All that means great visibility, great manoeuvrability, great parkability, and great headspace ability. 
This does have a few distinct driving quirks that it shares with some other electric cars, but they do make it more interesting and more enjoyable to drive. For example, it has paddle shifters, but of course it doesn't have a conventional gearbox, or maybe not of course, but it doesn't. And what they do instead is to give you more or less energy recuperation. It works in four stages from naught to three, where naught gives you no recuperation and three gives you the strongest effect. To put it in three, the effect is so strong that it's like putting the brakes on. It's fun because you can actually game it. So if you're in town, you can get around by not ever really having to touch the brakes. You have to be careful when you're braking without using the brake pedal, obviously, but it is quite good fun. The flip side of that, which is also kind of fun and unique to an electric car, is that when you're in level zero, this thing is unreasonably slippy. If you think about it, right, it's a blocky, high SUV shaped car. And yet when you're doing 30 to 40, it just seems to go forever of its own volition takes ages to slow down. And it's stuff like that that you have to concentrate on really because it's all a distraction from how basically boring this car is underneath all the electricity stuff. Silver center console aside, it's as bland as can be. Mostly black, hard plastic and old school rocker switches. <laughs> And yet, generally it gets the basics right. All the stuff that feels well honed in the standard corner. Decent driving position that everybody will get comfortable with. Logical infotainment that's not frustrating to use. Just a feeling of solidity. But then around town in particular, the electric car gives you all that with a big extra dollop of refinement and futuristicness. And what that does is turn a bang average crossover, which is what the corner really is, into a really appealing one. Of course, there's a catch, and it's the same catch that you get with most really good cars. Show me the money! Yep, costs to get one of these. Too much, frankly. Now, Hyundai will sell you a base model one with the lower range battery, or will it? If you look at the UK website at the moment, there is no mention of the base model. So I did a journalism thing, and I asked Hyundai what was going on. This was the reply. And it kind of makes what I'm about to say about the base model completely pointless, for now at least, but I'll just do it anyway. And that keeps the price close to 30 grand. And while that's pretty much the going rate for a decent electric car now, sort of, it's almost twice the price of a basic petrol Kona. And that, I'm sure you'll agree, is ridiculous. It doesn't matter how much money you save in fuel on one of these, how much less tax you pay, how much extra equipment you get as standard compared to a more petrol Kona. That's a price bump that you will just never make up. Also, the car I'm driving is 40 effing grand. So at this point, I'm just gonna stop and show you some other cars that you can get for 40 effing grand. The fact is that in that context, this car here, the one I'm driving, does not in any way feel like 40,000 pound or near enough worth of car. But I think that's missing the point a bit. If you like what you see here and you just want to get into a corner as cheaply as possible, then sure, buy the 17 grand one. But right now we're in the embryonic stages of a paradigm shift in personal mobility. And by investing in an electric car like this, you are helping to move things forward. And this is a car that genuinely makes the job easier. Big range, the sort of range that could just about get you from Newcastle to London. What? No, I've got much better things to do than be stuck in a service station on the M25. And generally, one of the most agreeable runabouts on the market. So let's say that you're not put off by the list price. You're a company car driver, say, and the tax break makes an electric car extremely alluring. And let's also say that you are free and unburdened by capricious notions of class and prestige. Maybe you're a Buddhist or just a great person. What's in it for you to get one of these? Well, aside from all the stuff I said before about it being lovely to drive and what have you, you do get loads of stuff as standard. And the top spec car might not feel like a chariot of prestige in the same way something with, I don't know, an Audi badge or something would. It certainly looks like one on paper and occasionally feels like one. Like it's got ventilated seats and gloveless gloves so you can keep your hands warm and your arse cool at the same time. Now that is the signature body temperature differential for a bona fide posh person. Cornering. Doesn't matter in a car like this but will do some anyway. Obviously it understeers but it doesn't roll as much as you think it's gonna. 
and even when the tires are squealing it still feels fairly level fairly stable and not like it's going to do anything unpredictable and stupid that might make you go into a hedge say don't like the brakes though the brakes are a little bit difficult to modulate it's a bit of an old school problem most electric cars seem to have sorted this out now but in this car the brakes seem to have a nothing and then all quality an all or nothing quality you might say that's not a problem there are cars with worse brake feel than this but it is something that you have to concentrate on that little bit harder in order to avoid braking like a complete amateur if you test drive the higher powered one of these, when you get out, the characteristic that you will remember most vividly, apart from the lack of internal combustion noise, is the pickup. Anywhere from standstill up to like 50, 60 miles per hour, if you mash your foot down on the floor in this thing, it just goes off. Now what that makes is obviously is just great around town because it feels completely responsive, really good at overtaking as well, so it's safe. What you heard there was wheel spin from an electric compact crossover. How times have changed. Now on issues of charging, not much has changed since I did the Audi e-tron a couple of weeks ago, funnily enough. But to recap, if you live next to a super duper 100 kilowatt charger, then you can get your Kona juiced up from nothing to full in less than an hour. We probably don't live near one of those, so for most people you'll be getting a wall box installed. And that means a 9 to 10 hour overnight charge, or of course, you can plug it in next to your phone. You know the electric drill by now. <laughs> electric drill? Didn't notice that. <laughs> oh, sorry, did I get you? It's an electric drill! You get me, you kill me! Okay, so conclusions. Now, personally, I prefer the BMW i3. I just think it looks more futuristic and it's just more fun. And let's be honest, it's a BMW. I'm not a Buddhist. But that is more expensive than this. It does have challenging looks, is one way of putting it. And it's not quite as practical. The corner is more conventional, where conventionality is a positive trait. And also, it is better than a Nissan Leaf in every conceivable way. So there you go, Corner Electric, big mileage, big price, not so big cabin, and a quite heavily caveated recommendation. Albeit, it is a recommendation. It's not the sort of car that I would buy personally, but if you are in the market for an electric runabout, I would definitely tell you to go and drive one. It is a surprisingly enjoyable and anxiety-free electric car experience. Thanks for watching, hope that wasn't too boring. Please watch our other stuff and please subscribe. That really helps us out. And I'll see you next week. Okay, bye. I don't know why I did that so aggressively. One of the most bizarre and hilarious experiences you can have in motoring is being in a traffic light in one of these next to an Impreza Turbo and pulling away a lot quicker than it can. I don't normally do stuff like that, that's the behavior of a wham, but fate brought that situation together and I just felt like doing it. The characteristic that you will, what are you beeping at us for?